Our Bible word is 1 Corinthians 15, the verses 20 to 21. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So this is Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Christians in Corinth. And there were some who denied the necessity or the truth of the resurrection of the dead or of the body. And of course, Paul was also addressing other issues in Corinth, like there were divisions and sexually immoral behavior, etc. And now some who deny that there's a resurrection of the dead. So, of course, Paul has to address this. And if we go to verse 12, this is the, main, this is the reason he is writing chapter 15. He says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Now Paul, in the first part of chapter 15, he wants to establish the fact of the resurrection. I mean, this is the basis of Christian belief. And he also begins by citing a creedal formula. In other words, a creedal formula are words, passages that were often repeated in the early church. They were core elements of faith. For example, Jesus is Lord. That's a creedal formula. Also, if we go to chapter 15, verses 3 to 5, Paul also cites a creedal formula. For I delivered to you first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. Then Paul also adds his own little bit in verse 6. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Then he also says he was seen by James, that Jesus' brother. And then Paul says, myself, Jesus appeared to me. So there's this whole list of witnesses of Jesus' resurrection in support of his argument. There is a resurrection of the dead. Then Paul also writes to them and say, why do you question that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because it also says, if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. Interesting, Paul connects the sacrificial death of Jesus with his resurrection. They go hand in hand. Paul says if Jesus died and there was no resurrection, we're still in our sins. There's no forgiveness of sins. No sacrifice of atonement took place. So there's a special significance of Jesus' death. It also goes hand in hand with his resurrection. They can't be separated. It's those two combined that brings about also forgiveness of sins. Paul also tells them, if there's no resurrection of the dead, we are liars. Because we've said that God raised him from the dead. So let's look at what Paul writes in verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And Paul also <laughs> says that if we only believe in Jesus in this life, in other words, there's no resurrection, we are the most pitiable of all people. What's the point? Why are we doing this? Of course, also, why am I an apostle? Why am I doing all this, preaching you the gospel, if Christ has not risen? I'm wasting my time. Me, my message as an apostle to you would also be meaningless. Now, again, in support of his argument that there is a resurrection, we come again to our Bible word. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So Paul says, Christ is risen. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, the first fruits refers to those pilgrimage festivals of the Jews, spe specifically the Feast of Weeks, which also came to be known as Pentecost. That's when the Jews came to the temple and they brought like the first fruits. 
it was an agricultural festival. So the first of the wheat, the first breads that were baked from the first wheat, etc. was brought to the temple. It was a way to acknowledge God's ownership of the land, His provision through the land, first fruits, but also it implied more was to come. In other words, the full tithe of the land, of the produce, will still come, and that would come at the next pilgrimage festival, etc. So the implication, yeah, Paul says, if Christ is the first fruits, more will rise from the dead. Jesus is only the first one. He's the first of many. Paul also connects Jesus' resurrection with the story of Adam. Both Adam and Jesus, they were prototypes of a certain type of humanity. As he says there, for since by man came death. In other words, this man he refers to is the story of Adam, the fall. Adam introduced humanity that is sinful and that is subject to death. Jesus, but Paul also refers, if we go to verse 45, as the last Adam. So, so Jesus is a new kind of Adam because he is the prototype of a new humanity that will be raised from the dead, who exists in the perfect image of God, who will exist in the kingdom of God, who overcomes sins, who, who overcomes and conquers sin, death and evil. Jesus is the prototype of this new humanity. He is the last Adam. Jesus inaugurated this new form of humanity through his resurrection. So the, the history of humanity is summed up in the life of Adam and the new Adam, Jesus. This is also what Paul brings together in verses 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So Adam brought death, sin and death. Jesus brought righteousness and life. And that's the meaning also of Jesus' resurrection. This is what happened. Remember the eyewitnesses that Paul lists right at the beginning. This has happened. And it's inaugurated a whole new state of affairs for the human race. Jesus is the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep. His resurrection, there will be life, death, and then resurrection, new life that Jesus brought about. He will be the first of many.